8.30 in the morning. Hopefully the sun isn't too much of a glare here. Uh, and I got a World War Three update for you. I got, it's kind of like one of those weird things like I always say. It's like you get nothing, you get nothing, you get nothing, and also bang, everything to come at once. So I actually took notes. Yes, the channel is progressing to the point where I'm actually using post-it notes. So that, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, that, that shows professionalism. It's your post-it note, you know. And I got lots of stuff on here. And uh, where, where should I start first? Oh, I guess I'll start with uh, RIMPAC. So RIMPAC 2016 is coming up. I think it goes from June to October. Don't quote me on that. And basically, that's the big Navy exercises. It? But again, like anything, all these drills are getting bigger. Uh, this one, I think, is going to be a record breaker. More ships, more personnel, more everything than, than there was. So that, that's uh, one. Um, the, let's see, uh, Germany has now declared Russia an enemy, which is kind of a scary thing. Uh, and there's a whole speech lead up to that between a Russian uh, commander or general or ex-general or whatever on Russian TV. And he was saying, he had quite the response to that, saying that that's a bad idea. Uh, so you got uh, over in Ukraine... Uh, this has been building for a while. Is uh, they're you know been sending a whole bunch of uh, tanks to the Donbass area uh, to take on you know that region. The Ukrainian military has been and I guess the uh, Azov battalion have been doing that, ratcheting up tensions. Uh, a few days ago or whatever, there was something like a couple of hundred artillery shells. You know, basically they're you know destroying the area working their way to the Crimea. Remember, the Crimea has like S-300, S-400 missile systems in it. It has Topol M's in it. it you know, the, the Crimea is locked down by the Russians. There's no doubt about that. There's no way you're going to get into there. Uh, yeah, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. I think, again, the Ukraine thing is just a stalemate. It's kind of... It's like... <sighs> NATO is backing the Ukraine to a degree, but they still have ragtag stuff. Like, they're not getting new tanks. They're not getting new airplanes and stuff like that. So I think what it is is, okay, well, they can't receive the, uh, the Crimea. That's, what, that's basically what the NATO wanted was that. Uh, the U.S. wanted that. That's why they did the, the, the coup, which, I mean, if anybody doubts there's a, you know, it was a U.S. coup in the Ukraine that overthrew the government, I mean, just listen to George Soros himself. Uh, again, one of the biggest war criminals out there. Yet he walks free. Uh, yeah, so they overthrew the government of Ukraine, you know, going on over two years now. And you have an East Ukraine, West Ukraine divide, just like I said there would be way before anybody else uh, put that out there. Uh, it was pretty easy to see coming. And I guess the goal was, again, to get Russia to respond into the Ukraine, which they didn't, uh, and then get them on the Polish border and then get a NATO retaliation. Again, the plan is to kill the Eastern Europeans fighting the Russians to wear down the Russian troops and, and equipment so that if they could do that, then NATO can come in and sweep and take them. Again, you have officials out there saying NATO is not ready to take on Russia. Uh, I'm not saying that NATO doesn't have as good equipment or whatever uh, and stuff like that, but what it is is that uh, the numbers. Like the Russians, they pretty much, not in all categories, but in some categories they outnumber, in some categories are undernumbered. But in the whole, soldier for soldier, airplane for airplane, tank for tank, ship for ship, the Russians pretty much got NATO covered. They pretty much got everything covered. Plus, they have the advantage of, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they've got, you know, they're more powerful than any military in their region, uh, stand alone, right? So like, there's not one Eastern European country that could uh, by itself take on Russia. There's just not one. Doesn't mean Russia wouldn't occur losses, but you know M Russia invests in its military. It invests a lot in its military, and it does it in such a way that it's not ridiculous. Uh, yeah, sure. There's you know like any the Russian government is very very corrupt. Everybody's always known that. Too. They've always been known for that. But one thing about it is that when it comes to the military stuff, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of bad deals that go on and people get paid off and what ha what have you. But they do design stuff that works. You know, it, it sometimes is a bit crude, but. A beaten stick's a beaten stick as long as it can get the job done, right? And so the Russians, they do, you know, make stuff that works. Um, with Syria, what's going on in Syria, they're also finding out, uh, you know, by rotating airplanes and stuff like that, what works in combat, what doesn't. So almost like just before World War II where the Germans got training in the Spanish War, uh, they basically, the, the Russians are getting training in Syria. Now you say, yeah, but so is NATO in the United States. Yes, that's true too. Uh, but the thing is, is the Russians are actually 
you know, really testing their equipment to the to the extreme for the first time uh, on foreign soil in that sense, in that kind of a setting, right? Whereas, yeah, they, they intervene, whenever, whenever the Russians usually intervene in another country, they usually send out the low-grade stuff. They don't send out the high-grade stuff. But in Syria, they are bringing in the high-grade stuff as well. And you can see that. And, of course, in Syria, uh, there's rumors that uh, ISIS has shot down a U.S. Uh, supply plane or something, or I don't know if, I don't think it was a fighter, but they, they shot down a, either a reconnaissance airplane or something like that. And, of course, the U.S. is denying this. And I'm going to get back to Syria in a bit. Again, there's some pretty crazy stuff in here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Russia is definitely on alert. Now, this is something I, I, I just caught a whim of it. You'll have to look into it for yourself. But apparently, because the Russians are pretty on edge right now. Like, they pretty much put out the statement that they can't retreat from NATO. NATO is completely surrounding them. And they reserve the right to preemptively strike the missile systems that are going around NATO. So, basically, Putin has fired up to 50 commanders that, uh, I don't know how, what the litmus test was or what, but anyway, guys that would not go uh, all the way. You know, in other words, if NATO would attack, they would stand down. So, unlike Obama, where Obama fired, like, you know, like 200 personnel or whatever, military personnel, to get yes men uh, that, you know, basically wouldn't go along with the war, uh, and you just put in, you know, your, you know, Petraeus and those type of guys who are really, you know, Petraeus is kind of a flip-flop uh, in a lot of ways. But the thing is, is that uh, at the end of the day, you got these really incompetent, spineless cowards uh, for generals in the States that are, you know, basically, what are, they don't even, I don't even think they really realize what they're doing. Because if they did, they would definitely stop doing what they're doing. And you would have a military coup in the United States. You know, because just just out of self-preservation, uh, going to war with Russia is a death sentence for the world. That said, the Russians, what they're doing is they're looking for guys that are going to commit whenever, whenever, because they, they, right now they, they're convinced that there, there's war is an inevitable, there's no way out of the war. Uh, it, it's beyond, it's almost at an irreversible point where Russia is going to have to do something soon. Uh, soon meaning in the next couple of years. Uh, so, what that means is the generals and commanders or whatever that Putin has fired may uh, fail some sort of test, I can imagine, that they wouldn't be considered reliable enough to respond to NATO. So they've got guys that are going to respond to NATO. So that means they're already responding to NATO. That They're already uh, wargaming. They're already uh, way ahead of this. And this is nothing new. This has been going on since the first Cold War, and we're now in the second one. So <coughs> also, too, the Russians... Uh, are building up uh, in uh, trans, uh, uh, trans uh, uh, sorry Tajikistan, and they got a deal. It always seems like they come out to the year 2042. It was the same deal that the Russians had with uh, Crimea, you know, to keep their troops there till 2042. And well, they're going to be doing the same thing in uh, Tajikistan. And again, I think that's kind of a bit of a counter. Uh, the Russians are countering, you know, through uh, uh, Tajikistan and Armenia. And places like that, they're basically, um, basically like covering this, the southern parts of Russia so that when all these uh, U.S. funded jihadi groups, which again openly admitted by George Soros and stuff like that, uh, and other people, and uh, NATO commanders uh, funding rebel groups, you know, basically they start a, a conflict over something else on the borders of Russia, and then they get it to spill over to Russia, so Russia has to tie up its resources fighting terrorists. But the Russians have, have uh, put so much, they got out ahead of it so far uh, by, you know, getting the, the anti-terrorism groups out there, well trained up, ready to go. They've always kind of had those gr groups anyway uh, to counter, you know, domestic terrorism. But they, they, they've done it in such a way now that it makes a, um, you know, a jihadist, uh, uprising, you know, on the Russian border a lot more difficult because the Russians are already there. And that's what, I think that's what this is a part of, uh, going by previous, uh, previous stuff. Now, the Turkish coup, okay, I should get a little pen to cross off what I talked about here, but the Turkish coup, okay, uh, it, I'm thinking it was a Russian-backed coup. Here's why. Now, we know how crazy Erdogan is over there, Cracking down on people, uh, basically, what, uh, 
6,000 people were arrested in one night. I think it's up to 50,000 people right now arrested as considered political dissidents, all that stuff. And the thing about it is that there, the rumors, or not the rumors, but the, 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 the situation seems like this, that the coup, it just seems like it, it was foiled so easily. And historically looking, most coups are successful. They're not, they're not, you know, and sometimes they're failed coups, but a lot of them are successful. But one thing that's common with almost every coup is they're usually never very, very quick. They're not done in a day like this. Uh, so it does kind of appear that uh, Turkey has come out and said that they were, are willing to work with a U.S.-Russian coalition. That tells me that possibly with the sanctions that Russia put against Turkey, and with, uh, you know, uh, Turkey basically, you know, hurting from that, they might have double-crossed NATO. That said, it would be a strange double-cross because in one sense, Turkey can't come out and say, yeah, well, we're going to join the Russian side now. They can't do that. They would lose too much. However, what the Russians might be doing uh, is the same thing they're doing in, in, in Britain right now, is they got spies all over the place. And I can imagine the spy vs. spy going on right now is something ridiculous. Uh, all agents, every, like it's 007 everywhere, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, against double agent Ivan, you know what I mean? Like that type of thing. So, what it looks like is that Turkey is now kind of just hinting at opening up to Russia and being probably less aggressive to Russia. We've already saw uh, Erdogan uh, apologizing to uh, Putin over the shootdown of the jet. That's a huge change in rhetoric. That, 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 that is monstrous. So something's going on behind the scenes. We'll have to watch and wait. But what I would think is the deal was would be, because it would be in Russia's best interest, if they can ransack Turkey uh, geopolitically, NATO is, is going to lose the Middle East completely. Uh, they, they would lose it. Because if, if Turkey turns its back on ISIS and stops funding ISIS and stuff like that, then that's it. Where do they go? They can either go into Israel, uh, which, you know, the Israelis, they do let the ISIS guys come into the, to their area, uh, but they control it. But to have all of them go in there, you know, running back and forth across the border, uh, it, it, the jig will be up, number one. Everybody will know for sure that ISIS is being funded by Israel and the United States uh, and, and a bunch of other countries. Or they have to go back to Saudi Arabia or stay in Syria. That's their only real options for ISIS. Uh, but if they stay in Syria, I mean, the Assad regime is clobbering the crap balls with the Russians, uh, clobbering the crap balls out of the, uh, the the jihadists. Now, the coalition strikes, apparently there was a huge coalition strike, a NATO strike, that killed a whole bunch of civilians. Uh, not a word on the mainstream media about it, but it does look like 150 people were killed in one of these these bombs. I'm not saying the Russians don't kill anybody in their airstrikes. Uh, I mean, this is a war, right? So bombs are falling, they don't discriminate. Uh, it is what it is. But it also, again, appears that NATO is more going after the infrastructure to take down Assad than they are to go after ISIS. Uh, which brings me back to that so-called U.S. airplane or whatever it was, helicopter, whatever it was shot down by ISIS. The reason why the U.S. could not admit this, if it was true, is simple. What weapon were the terrorists using to shoot down the airplane? It's American-made. It's tow missiles. It's stinger missiles. They're American-made weapons. So people are going to ask, how come these guys have such a fresh batch of you know, American-made weapons? Then you have to say, well, they got them through Saudi Arabia. Well, where did Saudi Arabia get them? They got them through the CIA, etc., etc. And the rumor of the State Department fighting with the CIA, I don't know if that's true, but I'm pretty sure at some point we might actually see you know, a conflict within the United States on this. Uh, so with that going on, again, Assad's pretty well planted. And after, I didn't get to, I just have been so busy running back and forth to town there from a motorcycle course, that I didn't get to see that uh, interview with Assad yet, uh, the, the most recent one, where he says that Syria might, you know, they might retake Syria in a few months, which would be great if they could, because then the world will stabilize. But like I said, as Syria stabilizes, the, uh, the, the rest of the Middle East is going to get torn apart, because you're going to be pushing these jihadis right back into Libya, right back into, um, yeah, that's another place for them to go, because they do stage in Libya pretty, pretty much, and all these other places. So... With that going on, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But it's still, right now, the, the Syrian Arab army, is they're still kicking ass pretty good. They're taking losses, don't get me wrong. I mean, they are equipped slightly better than the ISIS troops. But at the end of the day, it's really an analog war, you know, uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, they're still, you know, they're still line of sight kind of fighting. Uh, the tow missiles are still line of sight, so to speak. Uh, the Stinger missiles are still line of sight. 
So it's still an analog war in that sense. So uh, analog meaning line of sight. Uh, it's, you know, they're not firing you know, from over the tree line like a hellfire type of thing. Uh, using satellite guided weaponry, they're not doing that. They're line of sight, and the same with the tanks, and same with whatever. So that we'll have to keep an eye on. Uh, another thing is, uh, let's see what your, yeah. Uh, this one is big. I'll stay in Syria on this one because this one, it's kind of confirmed, kind of not. But something I said when uh, you know I always said. Why has it taken Russia so long to jump in and intervene when they did? But, but I also said when they do, they're just going to sweep from one end of the country to the next. Goodbye, jihadists. And for the most part, that's what the Russians have been doing. But it appears that there's a huge rumor out there, whether it's true, uh, it's denied by the United States, which I can understand why, but apparently Russia uh, struck a U.S. base in Syria. Now, we do know that the, uh, the Americans have been building bases in Syria, again, just building bases in a foreign country uh, at willy-nilly. Uh, so that said, you know, remember, the only people that have permission to be in Syria are the Russians. Uh, everybody else has just kind of come in. So the, the rule of law wasn't observed even by the United Nations standards for that. And the, the, the uh, response you get is, well, Assad's a dictator, we don't need permission. So, uh, But it goes against international law is, is the bottom line. So... That type of thing. Now, if Russia did hit a U.S. base, they killed U.S. personnel. There's no doubt about that. And they, but, so why wouldn't the U.S. be up in arms and, and just screaming about this if this was true? Well, two reasons. Who else was on the base? Well, I could suspect, and this is something I suspect every time you hear the U.S. saying stop hitting the moderate rebels, is there's probably dead Mossad and CIA agents all over, the, all over Syria because of the Russians. I can imagine there's lots of dead Russian special forces as well. We're never going to see that side of the war. It's a, it's a cloak and dagger war at that point. But they can't say, well, how come the Russians are going to sit, come out and say, well, we hit a bunch of jihadists. This was al-Nusra and, and uh, ISIS and al-Qaeda or whatever, all these guys. Uh, why were your guys amongst them? And again, it, the Russians have this crazy upper hand where all they have to do to make the U.S. look bad is tell the truth. Or force the U.S. To, to show their hand, which makes them look bad again. So what it comes down to is, yes, if this happened, um, take this one with a grain of salt, but if it happened, it means, yes, the CIA was right alongside ISIS, which is pretty much openly admitted right now, because uh, even on the CBC here in Canada, like they're pretty much, you know, after they talked about Assad's uh, last speech there, they pretty much said, yeah, and uh, the U.S. is still going to back the moderate rebels as a proxy army to overthrow uh, overthrow Assad, the Assad regime. But here's the kicker on that. You can't say moderate rebels because even the U.S. can't even point out who the moderate rebels are. Oh, the only thing you can find on the ground are ISIS-compliant rebels, <laughs> that type of thing. And they're made up of, you know, what, like 1,100 different jihadi groups. So uh, now they're calling them uh, the Syrian Democratic Army or something stupid like that uh, instead of ISIS. But it's the same guys. It's always the same guys. So that, that there, it does appear to have some legs on it. Uh, but, again, you'll never get an admission on it because of who's involved. And I'm assuming if the CIA is there, the Mossad is there. And, again, we've already had those Mossad agents spill the beans last year about how, you know, Israel helped create uh, ISIS. And, again, like Al-Qaeda, you know, this is all U.S. foreign policy and Israeli, Greater Israel Project, foreign pol US, uh, Israeli foreign policy as well. It, 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 it's what it is. You know, and, again, if you follow this channel, you know this by now. So that, that we'll have to keep an eye on. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure the, the Russians have probably hit several CIA assets by now. They, 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 they must have. And I'm sure they do it on purpose. Because when the State Department comes out and says, well, Russia is just hitting our guys. They're hitting the moderate rebels. That's all. You know, they're not hitting the ISIS guys. They're hitting our guys. They're probably right. They're probably telling the truth there. But the problem is, is that if you were to investigate it, you'd find their guys are ISIS. You know, I mean, you can't distinguish one from the other. They're all, they're all, they're all the same, right? Oh, uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS don't get along. Oh, uh, the Free Syrian Army is at odds with it. the Free Syrian Army. Might have existed in the beginning. Uh, there might be remnants of it, but they are fighting alongside Al Nusra, Al Qaeda, ISIS, uh, Arab uh, Democratic Army, whatever, whatever they're. They're the, they're all one group right now. So. Uh, yeah, and even the Kurds have, you know, pointed this out, you know, waiting for weapons delivery by the United States that never get there. 
Uh, and again, all these weapons deliveries that end up in the hands of ISIS. Again, just you know, uh, think of some of these these uh, you know payload experts on some of these airplanes dropping weapons. These guys don't miss. You know, just to fly a Globemaster, you're looking minimum 400 hours flying experience on other aircraft just to get there, and you're probably going to train for 2,000 hours on this aircraft before you can even do your first mission. You know what I mean? Or first real mission. These guys know what they're doing. They're not. They're not lost. They're not dropping somewhere where they're not supposed to be dropping. They're doing exactly what they're told. So how it keeps falling in the hand, all these weapons keep falling in the hands of ISIS. Uh, either A, they're the luckiest terrorist group in the world, or B, they're being supported. Which do you think it is? Um, all right, as far as the numerous terrorists, I'm up early enough that I think I'm up before the terrorist attacks in Europe. Uh, God knows what's going to happen today. Yesterday there was a priest killed. I put out a, a video of the 10th Crusade on that. And uh, the siege of Germany should be out today. But yeah, it looks like uh, as I was making that video, another attack happened and a priest who had his throat slit. Uh, there was two jihadists, whatever. And again, in France, there, you know, the people, the, the um, which guy was it? it basically, one of the, uh, like a, a chief, a police chief or whatever. I thought it was a politician, but it was like a police chief or something like that. Uh, in France, is like the people, the gun owners are getting ready to revolt, and, and you know they're going to have a revolution. In other words, they're going to go around killing Muslims. That's what they're going to do uh, if they snap. I don't think it's going to happen, but people are getting fed up. Uh, I mean, we're in the you know France Revolution 2.0 anyway, or I guess you'd say 3.0 because there's been you know one one you know the the reign of terror uh, revolution was probably the most popular, but there were ever other revolutions after that. This would be like the the third reign of terror, so to speak. Uh, so, yeah, with that going on, uh, Merkel, again, completely silent on it, uh, these attacks. Obama making jokes about the attack, uh, you know, well, addressing the attacks. <laughs> it's, it's just a bizarre world we live in. But it's getting to the point where people are seeing it for what it is. Now, that said, with the election, i, I, I got to pull in the election. The Hillary Clinton campaign has reached a progressive all-time outstanding you know, award here. Uh, if you haven't seen the anti-Donald Trump thing, it, it's so funny because it is as PC as it could possibly, as many minorities as they could get, as many women as they can get, saying, you don't speak for us, you don't speak for us. But how polarizing it gets when people are going to watch this and says, okay, it's only women and minorities in this commercial. And it really probably is going to send a message to basically, particularly white males, and even Cenk Uger uh, uh, from the Young Turks, uh, was flipping out about this, that Donald Trump is, a, you know, uh, appealing to all the white males out there. Well, why wouldn't he be? <laughs> why wouldn't he be? Uh, and Hillary Clinton's uh, diversity, anti-Trump diversity commercial, pretty much just put, hits the nail on the head. This is, if you vote for Hillary Clinton, this, you, you're voting for that. You're voting to give up everything. You know, you're voting for this progressive minority rule, everything but, you know, uh, anti-family, uh, you know, LGBT, uh, pro-mass immigration. That's exactly what that com commercial branded. Uh, so thank you, Hillary Clinton. You probably just, you know, sealed the deal. Now that said, Hillary Clinton is still going to win the election. How they're going to steal it from Donald Trump, I don't know. If you didn't see what happened at the RNC with uh, Bernie Sanders, <laughs> I saw a great little, uh, great little uh, meme on it. It was a picture of a Bernie Sanders doll. And it said, these things keep selling out. Uh, or they can't stay on the shelves because they keep selling out. So think about how hardcore Bernie was against Hillary Clinton in, in, in his campaign. And now she's the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, to the point where people were booing Bernie Sanders. How distraught is the left with itself right now? So I don't know if it's, uh, would this be considered Marxist fighting Trotskyites? I, I don't know what the argument would kind of be. But yeah, you, you basically, yeah, you see dissent on the, on the Republican side like Ted Cruz and stuff like that, between the actual Republican Party members. But the people who are supporting Donald Trump, uh, you know, even the people that don't support Donald Trump, they're going to get behind him. You know, they're going to get behind him. Now, at the uh, Republican uh, convention, yeah, you had Ted Cruz again, you know, whining like a baby. Uh, I'm glad Ted Cruz kind of showed himself for the weasel that he actually is. Uh, you know, because he's just such a slimy person. Uh, and, and, you know, such a, ugh, he, he's just disgusting. Um, may have had some good ideas, but when you see his true colors, with Donald Trump, I think you see his two true colors right away. So there's no surprises with him. Uh, that said, is he controlled opposition? You never know, right? Uh, is he the best candidate you could possibly get? Well, he's the best lot of the bunch, but 
you know, that's not saying much, right? There, there's a, but that also tells you how far gone the country is. Uh, as a Canadian watching it, you know, it's like, we thought our election was out of control, but the, this one is like, this one, this one's going to be one for the history books, you know. But that said, uh, the dissent amongst the Republicans was right, right, right away between the Republican Party members, not the public. The public that support Donald Trump support Donald Trump, and the public that didn't, they're still going to support Donald Trump because it's like, well, he's our best chance at least getting the GOP. But that said, Donald Trump has killed the GOP, killed political correctness, and Hillary Clinton has completely divided the uh, Democratic uh, Party. So with Bernie Sanders supporters, I don't know who they're going to vote for. Who, who are they going to vote for? Like, there's just nobody for them to vote for. And Bernie Sanders, well, uh, you know, uh, and, and you saw like Sarah Silverman calling the people ridiculous and uh, all this. It was kind of funny because it's like, that's the typical of the left. They just, you know, like they, they, they get to the point of such insolvency and rip themselves apart. It's, 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 you know, it's kind of fun to watch in a sadistic kind of way because it's just like they're so, you know, they're so far left that they just can't get along with anybody, you know, uh, that type of thing. They, they don't have a vision. They, they lack vision. Uh, the only th campaign thing they're going with now is uh, we got to do whatever we got to, you know, and it, unfortunately it worked up here in Canada. Oh, we got to get Harper up. Well, Harper for the next four years would have been a benefit to Canada. Even with the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, we could get rid of that. It would have been a perfect kind of downtime with a balance, four years of balanced budget to get lined up perfectly to install a nationalist government in Canada, which we don't have a, we have a nationalist party in Canada, but it's, it's uh, I think they need to be revamped if they want to go anywhere. They got to get out of 1933 Germany. That, 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 that's my criticism to them. Um, they have to become Canada first and really Canadiana, that, that, that's, if that's a word. They have to be, do that for that to, to, to flourish for the next time. But we got Justin Trudeau for the next four years. Combine that with Hillary Clinton in the, in the States. Both economies will collapse. You know, I mean, the, the, the economies are collapsed. It's just, you know, they're, they're basically they got, they got the economy on life support in the States and stuff like that. So that said, you're now stuck with, uh, a, you, know, a, you know, like a complete shit show of a, of a thing going on with the Democrats in the States. I don't know what Bernie Sanders supporters are going to do because they hate Hillary Clinton. And I mean, when they're booing their own guy, that's awesome. That's awesome. Why? Because that just tells you that at least they're that awake. They're, they're still stupid enough to support Bernie Sanders. And trust me, I gave him a fair shake. He is a Trotskyite through and through. That's even, you know, Trotskyites and Marxists, you know, if you don't like Obama, you're not going to like Sanders at all. Oh, yeah, but he was going to go after the big banks and stuff like that. And, uh, none of them are going to go after the big banks. Not even Trump. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's not going to happen. The people have to go after the banks. It, you know, it's, it ha, that has to be a pitchfork revolution for that to work. That's the only way you're going to stop the banks. Why? Because every other candidate's in a pocket, right? Uh, but Trump would still do other good things. Uh, that said, the people, you know, kind of made fun of uh, the fact that uh, the Democratic Party convention had like a four miles of an eight-foot wall or something built around it. <laughs> And then, yeah, here they are talking about Trump. It's kind of like when, they, you know, people, oh, uh, Trump's a racist and a bigot for trying to put up a wall to keep the Mexicans out or whatever. And then nobody says about the, the, the 400 miles of wall to keep the Palestinians out in Israel, you know. So it's always, it's always these hypocrites, Zionists that come out and say this and never, you know, look, never look in the mirror. So I always kind of laugh at that. But that does play important because uh, the Russians have kind of pretty much openly support Trump. Putin has said, Hillary Clinton will lead to the Third World War. Pretty much, it, that's probably not an exact quote, quote, but as close as I can probably quote Putin. You know what I mean? And, again, is he just he doesn't really come off as the fear-mongery type in that sense. He does kind of just kind of come out, make the blunt statement, and the statement is based on this, 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 and this. I agree with him. If, I, if you follow Hillary Clinton enough, this woman will do anything to win. She is a lunatic beyond belief and dangerous, a dangerous one at that. Again, the Clinton Deadpools. Now, your, your Clintonites out there, they'll, they'll vote for Hillary Clinton, and I guess they'll join Hillary Clinton. And, uh, you know, she, they'll be alongside her in hell as well. Uh, this woman is just a complete nightmare. Uh, like, Bernie Sanders would collapse the economy because of, you know, again, like all communists and, and leftists, they don't know how to count. And there's no way, you know, they'd, they'd run up such a budget, and there's no way he could keep any of the promises. He, you know, free school, free this, free that. Now, Hillary Clinton is saying the same, same thing, but she has no intentions of doing it. She's just saying it to get elected. We're going to give free school for everybody, free tuition, forgive all the college loan debts and stuff like that. No. Um, 
first off, people who can't pay back loans shouldn't be getting loans, student or not. You know what I mean? And if you do, if they do want to do that, if the banks want to give loans to anybody with a pulse, you, t you don't bail out the banks anymore. That, you know, that you can't, so that also means deposits can't be insured anymore. But that, that allows things to fail. But that means the economy doesn't get to taken down by these too big to fails, which I say too complicated to work. So pretty much the endorsement by the Russian government, not 100% official, but pretty much openly open to it, they're for Donald Trump. Over in Hungary, Viktor Orban, um, or Orban Victor, whichever way you want to call him, um, he's the same thing. He's kind of endorsing Trump as well. And in Hungary, you know, they're... they're you know, they're holding their ground against the migrant crisis and whatever. And so I don't think Hungary will flip to pro-Russian side anytime soon. But they do see there will be a commonality. Uh, and you have to look at a trend here. If Viktor Orban if from Hungary is supporting Trump, and the Russians are supporting Trump, Trump is willing to talk and negotiate with anybody. Um, you know, I mean, that, that they make it sound like a bad thing that Trump is willing to negotiate with the Russians rather than, you know, go to war. And if you listen to Zebra Buzinski in the last past couple of months there, I mean, this guy frothes at the mouth with the idea of a thermonuclear war with Russia. This guy is completely crazy. And I forget what uh, news show his daughter's on. But it's, again, you, you could see all the, the, the agendas there. So uh, so that's what the Russians are doing. Now, I'm going to go to China. Uh, this one's kind of interesting because I don't know quite what to make of it, what statement, I understand the statement the Chinese would be making with this, but they basically fired off a, a ballistic missile test in 2010, and it's a weird video. They shot something outside the Earth's atmosphere, so it's, it's an anti-satellite, anti-ballistic missile system of some sort that they fired off. I forget the name of it, it's the H, H, QH-9 or HQ-9, or something like that, whatever missile system they use. Uh, basically, the, the Chinese version of the S-300 missile system. Uh, or it could have been a Dongfang something, Dongfang 11, Dongfang 21, Dongfang 41, 31, whatever it would have been. Whatever it was, they fired at, in 2010, but they released the footage now. And obviously this footage is being released uh, with what happened in The Hague uh, of, uh, you know, saying that China doesn't have a claim to the, those territorial waters uh, in, 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 the, in the South China Sea. has really put China on edge right now. And they're going to have... You know, an aviation identification zone. They're they're going to defend those islands. Uh, it does for it. It's basically NATO force in conflict uh, with China. So again, right now the we are kind of getting closer to the war because things have stepped up. If you follow this channel, you know I don't just do fear mongering. We are talking about events that happen. Yes, I speculate on what might happen in the future as a result of these events, but I think I call things pretty close. And you can see this is a step up in rhetoric. It's, 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 it's like the quickening. The events aren't getting bigger, but they're getting more frequent. And what the Chinese are saying here is, yes, we can take down your satellites. You might be able to take down ours, but we can take down yours. And I could say this. In an analog war against the Chinese, the death tolls, no North American country, uh, no European country is willing to go through that again. We've already done it in World War II. We're not going to do that again. The people will revolt. They will turn on the governments. And I think that's kind of the turning point we're at. <clears throat> we're that close to a populism revolt everywhere. And I think it's just a penguin effect. One country is going to do it, then another country, then another, and it's just going to be governments overthrown everywhere. It's too insolvent. We can't wait to redo the laws. The problem is, is that leads to civil wars, leads to a lot of bloodshed and stuff like that within uh, in, in, the, in the conflicts. But what the Chinese are basically saying with this missile test is we'll shoot down anything that you, you try to, you know, you know, we can defend ourselves. That's what they're saying with this. And they can, and I do believe that the Chinese would fight an island hopping war, and they would probably conquer from Australia to Guam to, to probably even Hawaii. They probably, I don't think they would ever take Hawaii, but they would have ships right up to that point. They would have air defense missile systems covering that whole body of water and every island in between. They would probably conquer the Philippines. They would probably take Taiwan. They would probably take, uh, I don't know, Japan would probably be taken in the long run, but not in the short run. Uh, South Korea, well, the Nor they'll just let the North Koreans deal with that, uh, that type of thing. So that's kind of what's going on uh, there. And I, I guess I'll kind of end up on this here. The Russians have said right from 2010 that if these missile systems go too close to Russia's borders and completely threaten the sovereignty of Russia, Russia has no point, uh, they can't retreat. They're... they're there is no, no way for them to retreat. Their, their, their country is surrounded. 
And this would give, give, they would reserve the right to preemptively strike these missile systems. Now, will the Russians do it? I think at some point, yes, they will. Why? Because that could be the Putin crazy man bluff charge. The other thing I think they would do before that, they would probably do a bluff charge just before that. And that bluff charge, which they've already been talking about, is lighting off a nuclear warhead. Uh, there's a, uh, a small island in the Baltics that they want to do a demonstration. They're talking about doing this. They, they haven't set a date and time, but they've hinted at it, that they might do a demonstration. The idea is for the world to see how powerful these bombs are, because we've kind of forgotten. You know, uh, It's been a long time since the movie Trinity and Beyond, and if you haven't seen that documentary, it's excellent. Uh, uh, the, the new bombs that they have now, uh, warheads, are, are just in, unbelievably powerful. So Putin will do, do one of these things. We've, we've seen, you know, missile palooza, you know, warhead, te missile test, missile test, missile test. Uh, we've got the new uh, RS-28 coming out, Sarmat. This thing is, you know, is a planet smasher. God knows how many of those are going to build. But Putin playing the crazy man, I think, comes on the heels of the brink. Uh, it, it, it really does... Because at that point, it's kind of, we can't, t like Putin, Putin's last kind of, you know, addressing the Western media, saying you're lying to your people, you're keeping them in the dark. Uh, not only that, you make things up as you go. I'm sure the Russians, again, the Russians, they do the same thing too, but they're not propagandizing the world. And, you know, right now, there's three enemies. The war on terror with ISIS, which is not a false war, because they're actually, you know, it, it, really, it really pains me when I hear of U.S. troops getting killed by their own weaponry. That was supplied by their own government to the other side. Like, who, you know, I can understand why recruitment is so low. Anybody that's got a half a brain understands that. It's not even a pawn. It's like you're just cannon fodder uh, for this, this really false narrative. The second enemy is Iran, which Putin has addressed. These missile systems that are going around Russia are not to counter Iran. Iran's missiles can't... They, they, Iran's missiles cannot reach Romania. You know I mean? They're not going to reach that far. They might hit southern Europe at best. Uh... But they probably won't make it to Romania. And if they could, they would be just getting there. Um, that type of thing. The, the Iranians are building missiles to counter Israel, to wipe Israel off the map and possibly Saudi Arabia. And they might fire one or two into Europe, but the Iranians are not going to do this unless the Israeli attack on, uh, you know, or a NATO attack. It's the response to it. It's the same reason why Assad, what Assad's chemical weapons were going to be used for, was to attack NATO. If you attack us, we reserve that right. But I think Assad's playing this game a little bit better than that because he didn't attack anybody. And that, that's what's making NATO look bad because they don't have justification to go in there. There would, be no, there would be no regime change needed in Syria had John McCain not come out and back these so-called moderate rebels, right? So, again, regime change, people are catching on that regime change foreign policy of U.S. and Israel is, is, is devastation to the world. And people are rejecting it. Uh, it's just we don't have any candidates out there that are really anti-war yet. Donald Trump is pro-military. I wouldn't call him anti-war, uh, you know, but he's going to negotiate. Now, maybe, who knows? He, you know, everybody says, oh, he's going to be a dangerous president. But if you listen to Donald Trump, he's the only guy not calling for war with Russia or China. He's calling about negotiation, and that's the way to go. So the Russians on their TV, uh, I don't know how recent it was, but are basically out there saying we reserve the right to... You know, reiterating that, you know, stop putting these missile systems up. We're going to have to take them out at some point. Uh, that would, I think, come after a warhead test as a bluff. That would be the ultimate bluff of NATO. It's like, we just hit your missile sites. It's game on. Do you want to go or not? And at that point, either we go into war or not. Again, the Chinese, when they take a gamble, they win or lose. Uh, they don't lose anything. If they win, they win something, uh, or they win big. But if they lose, they, they don't lose any skin. They, they, they lose very little. The Russians are different. The Russians are, uh, you know, they call bluff. If we win, we win the whole table. If we lose, we lose an arm. You know, that, that type of thing. That's the way the Russians have always been. It's something in the, something in the breed. That's the way they do it. Uh, and, and so when they say that they, they will preemptively strike uh, these targets, at what point they will do it, I don't know. But I believe they will. You know, at some point they're going to have to do it. What incident will lead up to that, I don't know. But... That's the, that's the ultimate call of the bluff. Right after that, it's war. We're, we're into a war right after that. Um, but the Russians are doing everything they can to not get into war. The United States needs a war. Death and debt-based economy. The uh, people of the United States are waking up to this idea. They don't realize what it is yet. They understand U.S. foreign policy is bad, but they don't understand that that is your economy. It's a death and debt. Take the currency. If you don't take the currency and the debt, 
you get democracy JDAMs on your cities, you know, regime change or whatever. Everywhere the U.S. is destabilized, that's what happens. People are ditching the U.S. currency or not taking the currency. That, that's pretty much it. It's, a, it's not just for the oil. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a whole package. It's the oil, the minerals, everything like that, plus the currency, the petrodollar. And if you understand the petrodollar, um, and in and that. So the last thing is, pro, I, can't, I can't even pronounce the name of this commander anyway. He's an ex-commander or whatever. He was on Russian TV. And he was, I think, talking with some German delegates or whatever, saying, uh, anywhere you put NATO troops, okay, the body count is going to be astronomical. And he goes to the statement, remove NATO from our, uh, uh, yeah, from your countries, uh, or everybody's going to die. You know, he goes like, he goes, uh, you know, he's remove NATO from your countries or everybody's going to die. Because anywhere NATO is, and they told this to, uh, to Sweden, and, uh, and this is a bold statement, I, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing a bit, but, uh, it's pretty much that. That's pretty much this. Wherever NATO is, that's that's what we're targeting. So that's what they told Sweden. If you join NATO, you, there's going to be a nuke with your. There's going to be nukes with your name on it. Their NATO is considered an official enemy of Russia. This is official. They made this official uh, in 2012, I believe. That they are Russians aren't fighting. Uh, you know, a war on terror. They are gearing up openly to fight NATO. NATO is their number one threat. And if you look at where all the missile systems are, it's, you know, look at it on the map, you know. Um, I like that spoof map that uh, if Russia didn't want to have a problem with the, uh, the U.S., they shouldn't have put Russia so close to all the U.S. bases. <laughs> it's like just completely surrounds Russia. And same with China. Now, the thing is, is these banksters out there do want a war. They want Russia or China to shoot first. Russia or China are probably not going to do that. They will do it as a response to something. Uh, but if they did do that, a preemptive strike on NATO, they would only do this if they could seize the upper hand very quickly. And they would hit and wait for the retaliatory response. And in that retaliatory response, they would have some game plan that would probably make a complete sweep of Eastern Europe. And that would be known as, uh, uh, would, uh, be known as the new Western Europe uh, province, <laughs> or Western, uh, Western Russian province. <laughs> Russia, uh, like my uncle said, it took a lot of countries to make that. Russia took a lot of countries to make that country. Historically speaking, he's correct. You know, it did, it did engulf a lot of countries. Uh, this was back, you know, before the... Uh, the fall of communism in the Berlin Wall. So, uh, but you get the idea. Um, the rise of the Warsaw Pact 2.0 won't, won't come from volunteerism. It's going to come from, you know, conquering. And again, what they would have to do uh, to make this work, to do a preemptive strike on the United States, is cause an economic collapse first. Then it can't be blamed on Russia. Which is, that's, what they're, that's why they're, they're not shooting first. All they have to do is sit and wait. Even right now, like again, they're not even talking about recovery anymore on the news. Up here in Canada, okay, our economy right now is kind of flipping the... We're, we're going to be hitting our 2008 crash. Uh, I mean, Kathleen Wynne there in Ontario is talking about, um, you know, oh, our budget, uh, you know, our deficit's only going to... They're not even talking budgets, they're just talking deficits. So the next couple of years, it's going to be $50 billion or something like that. On top of, so no incentive whatsoever. These people, again, completely unaccountable, running up the debts on the future generations. They don't care. Uh, and there's going to be accountable when the shit hits the fan. That's why the last thing you want to be is a progressive or a liberal when the pitchfork revolution gets here. Because the pitchfork revolution, yes, will be the people throwing the Molotovs in the streets will be them. But what I refer to as the hellhounds, they're not going to be progressive lefties. They're going to be people that are very patriotic, taking back the country. Mostly active duty law enforcement, military behind the scenes, uh, because they know who to kill. <laughs> you know, like, it's that simple. I'm not making any threats. They know who to kill. They know who put ink to paper. They will take out anyone. Now, the question is, will the new, be, new boss be better than the old boss? Will you get a George Washington or a Saddam Hussein or Vidal Castro? That, I don't know. And unfortunately, if it gets to that, at that point, you have civil war, which will probably pull back the troops from NATO which then Russia can then make a sweep. And if they can make a sweep, uh, goodbye Eastern Europe. Uh, they, they will do it by force, they'll do it by whatever, but never again will NATO missile systems be on Russian borders. They might not necessarily conquer the countries, but they will take out any, infra any NATO infrastructure they can. They will seize that opportunity. And maybe that's what the Russians are waiting for. Is Again, as we get to, closer to the 2016 election, look, you have, like I said, the, the Democratic Party completely ripping itself apart. They don't know what they're doing. The progressives are doubling down on their, you know, their crazy lunacy ideology, 
and people are rejecting it. Even many people that were considered progressive left, once they understand what it is, Trotskyite, Marxism, uh, communism, you know, cater to the minority, that type of thing, open borders, and globalism, once they understand what the progressivism is of Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, 99% of people reject it. Only your hardcore leftists that are completely brainwashed will go with it. Um, whatever. So we're not, you know, it's, you're seeing, that's why you're seeing the Democratic Party being ripped apart from within. Uh, that's why. Now, I'm not saying the uh, GOP isn't being ripped apart from within, but it's not being ripped apart by the electorate, it's be, or by the, the people. It's being ripped apart by the corrupt people that are running. So the system is being revolted against in, in many levels. But only after the 2016 election will we have a better idea. If a civil war, if Hillary Clinton wins, there's civil war breaks out. But it won't take long for Hillary Clinton. Uh, first, she'll do probably a strike on Iran. Uh, then what will happen from then, it'll be boots on the ground in Syria as well, probably coinciding. And then from there, conflict with Russia. Russia will have to respond. And of course, in Eastern Europe, her stance on Eastern Europe, she'll probably move, you know, troops right in directly onto Russia's borders. There's already U.S. troops in uh, Ukraine, but the, the latch will start forming battalions into the Ukraine with the U.S. The U.S. will start fighting into the Donbass, then move its way to the Crimea. Once a U.S. tank starts opening fire and U.S. airplanes start opening fire or dropping bombs in the Crimea, you are now attacking, whether you re officially recognize it or not, you are attacking Russian sovereign territory. And that's how I think Hillary Clinton would probably get the war going with Russia, as a guesstimate. You know, it, it's, it's the game that would probably... Because I think even NATO has enough sense right now to know not to attack the Crimea. That would be a death sentence. Nukes will fly from the Crimea. Uh, that type of thing. That said, Russia has a plan or two, especially with South America, Nicaragua. You know, they're sending t a handful of tanks there. And it's not that they're sending a handful of T-72s there. That's not, the, that's not the issue. The issue is there's partnerships being built. Uh, they're opening up a surveillance uh, station in Cuba. This is what Obama's, you know, lifting sanctions on Cuba. You know, well, sanctions didn't work since the 1950s. Sanctions just don't work. On the same day as he's lifting sanctions against Cuba, he is putting sanctions on Russia and Iran. You know, so, and Syria and whatever. He's just, in North Korea. It's just like, okay, so it didn't work for Cuba. So what's Cuba really about? And this is what I said. Cuba will be destabilized by U.S. foreign policy. If it gets between the U.S. and the Russians start fighting over Cuba, it'll be very cloak and dagger, but it will not work out for the Cubans. That said, Rafael uh, Castro there, uh, I don't think he's going to be going against the Russians. I think he's going to, he's going to milk the U.S. for what it's worth, uh, but he's also going, you could clearly see that they're still very pro-Russian there. Uh, you know, with the surveillance station opened up in, in, in uh, Nicaragua and in um, uh, Cuba, again, that puts, a, that, that puts us at a different, it puts at a different advantage. And I can imagine in Venezuela, they must have Topol M's there by now. I'm, I can't see how they wouldn't have, uh, you know, missiles, S-300s, uh, S, you know, whatever, all throughout. The Russians are probably polluted all throughout South America, considering the communist leanings of South America. Uh, most people are progressive, communist, whatever. I don't know why the people down there ha haven't figured it out that they've got to move away from that, but they, they seem to get duped easy into this, these, these regimes. You know, communist dictators and cartels. That's pretty much what runs South America, which Russia can, and China have been taking advantage of that very clearly. And with the anti-U.S. sentiment worldwide, which Paul Craig Roberts was right on this, the Israeli foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy is designed to create resentment against the United States, which if you're, you know, and I, and I get comments from, again, the majority of my viewers are American, and I get comments from them all the time, like, why is there so much anti-American sentiment out there? Why, why is there so much hatred towards the United States? Well, it is from U.S. foreign policy. You know, it, it really does come from that. And U.S. foreign policy is based on Israel for, Israel's foreign policy, you know, basically for the Greater Israel Project, which I've already covered a big video on that. And if you don't know about it, if you, don't, if you understand the Greater Israel Project and Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, you understand what's going on in the world. And if you understand the petrodollar, the Anglo-American Empire, the transatlantic uh, uh, Anglo-American petrodollar on one side of the world, fighting with the other uh, Eurasia Pacific Empire, then you get the idea that it's empires fighting. So it's nothing new in history. Uh, the scale has changed, because uh, it's more global, and other than that, it, it's the same kind of recipe we've seen empire versus empire throughout history. The difference now is we live in the age of communication, and people can kind of 
foil these plans by exposing and keep exposing the corrupt politicians. The people that need to go to jail, ASAP, Henry Kissinger, George Soros, Zebra Buzinski, David Rockefeller, the whole Rockefeller clans that are doing things like that, uh, Rothschild, pick a Rothschild. The Rothschilds are funding Hillary Clinton directly, something like $70 million. They just donated to her campaign. Uh, Lady Rothschild. Get them all. Jacob Rothschild, Lady Rothschild, uh, uh, Evelyn Rothschild. These are really, really bad people. And just work your way down the list. The, the Trilateral Commission, the League of Rome, Committee of 300, uh, the Vatican, the um, Bilderbergers, uh, list goes on, and, uh, you know, New American Century. All these things are really bad. The United Nations, the, the people that run it, the people that work in it, most people are down here. They're compartmentalized and they don't understand what's going on. Most government workers don't. But once you understand what it is that you're looking at, it's like, I don't, anybody with a conscience can't work for the government. Anybody with a conscience can't work for the government. Anybody with a, with a brain can't work for the United Nations. Uh, because the United Nations is the person that directs NATO, you know, is, is the group that directs NATO for the next regime change, using Israeli and U.S. foreign policy for the Greater Israel Project. Again, follow the players, follow the money, you figure it out. Really. But the statement that uh, this general was making, uh, I caught it off of uh, Israeli news uh, with St uh, Stephen Benun. Um, good, it's a good source. He, he's, got, he's got a lot of good stuff there. Uh, he doesn't post very often, it doesn't seem, but when he does, he usually... And he got it off of Russian TV and he had all his links on there. I know I'm bad for not putting my links... People wonder how I figure all this stuff out, but I follow links of every, everybody else, right? And it's just a time restraint. Hey, but I am d down to making notes, so that's a good thing. So the statement that, um, you know, uh, if you keep building, you know, you know, like anywhere NATO troops are, you're going to die. You know, uh, and if you don't pull NATO troops back from our borders, everyone's going to die. Uh, I think that's a very bold statement from a very high official Russian uh, commander or general, whatever he was, retired or not. Uh, somebody with credibility. When somebody with credibility like that says something like that, I think, you know, you should listen. So anyway, if you like this kind of content, please consider making a donation to the channel. Link's down below. Thank you so much to everybody who has. If you want to make a, a money for yourself, my TSU link is down below. It doesn't cost you anything to join up. And uh, it's a lot of fun, so join up on that. Next to that, rate, subscribe, share, comment, like. Be true to yourselves. Be true to others. Always do the right thing. And have a great day. Good day. Hi, and welcome. All right. It's about 8.30 in the morning. Hopefully the sun isn't too much of a glare here. Uh, and I got a World War III update for you. I got it's kind of like one of those weird things like I always say. It's like you get nothing, you get nothing, you get nothing, and also bang, everything to come at once. So I actually took notes. Yes, the channel is progressing to the point where I'm actually using post-it notes. So that, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, that, that shows professionalism, your post-it note, you know. And I got lots of stuff on here. Now, where, where should I start first? Oh, I guess I'll start with uh, RIMPAC. So RIMPAC 2016 is coming up. I think it goes from June to October. Don't quote me on that. And basically, that's the big Navy exercise, is it? But again, like anything, all these drills are getting bigger. Uh, this one, I think, is going to be a record breaker. More ships, more personnel, more everything than, than there was. So that, that's uh, one. Um, the, let's see. Uh, Germany has now declared Russia an enemy, which is kind of a scary thing. Uh, and there's a whole speech lead up to that between a Russian uh, commander or general or ex-general or whatever on Russian TV. And he was saying, he had quite the response to that, saying that that's a bad idea. Uh, so you got uh, over in Ukraine, uh, this has been building for a while, is uh, they've they're, you know, been sending a whole bunch of uh, tanks to the Donbass area uh, to take on you know, that region. The Ukrainian military has been, and I guess the uh, Azov Battalion have been doing that, ratcheting up tensions. Uh, a few days ago or whatever, there was something like a couple of hundred artillery shells, you know, basically, they're, you know, destroying the area, working their way to the Crimea. Remember, the Crimea has like S-300, S-400 missile systems in it. It has Topolems in it. it you know, the, the Crimea is locked down by the Russians. There's no doubt about that. There's no way you're going to get into there. Uh, yeah, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. I think, again, the Ukraine thing is just a stalemate. It's kind of, it's like, <sighs> NATO is backing the Ukraine to a degree, but they still have ragtag stuff. Like, they're not getting new tanks. They're not getting new airplanes and stuff like that. So I think uh, what it is is, okay, well, they can't receive the, uh, the Crimea. That's, what, that's basically what the NATO wanted was that. Uh, the U.S. wanted that. That's why they did the, the, the coup, which, I mean, if anybody doubts there's, a, you know, it was a U.S. coup in the Ukraine that overthrew the government, I mean, just listen to George Soros himself. Uh, again, one of the biggest war criminals out there, yet he walks free. 
uh, yeah, so they overthrew the government of Ukraine, you know, going on over two years now. And you have an East Ukraine, West Ukraine divide, just like I said, there would be way before anybody else uh, put that out there. Uh, it was pretty easy to see coming. And I guess the goal was, again, to get Russia to respond into the Ukraine, which they didn't, uh, and then get them on the Polish border and then get a NATO retaliation. Again, the plan is to kill the Eastern Europeans fighting the Russians to wear down the Russian troops and, and equipment so that if they could do that, then NATO can come in and sweep and take them. Again, you have officials out there saying NATO is not ready to take on Russia. Uh, I'm not saying that NATO doesn't have as good equipment or whatever uh, and stuff like that, but what it is is that uh, the numbers, like the Russians, they pretty much, not in all categories, but in some categories they outnumber, in some categories they're undernumbered, but in the whole, soldier for soldier, airplane for airplane, tank for tank, ship for ship, the Russians pretty much got NATO covered. They pretty much got everything covered. Plus, they have the advantage of, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they've got, you know, they're more powerful than any military in their region, uh, stand alone, right? So, like, there's not one Eastern European country that could, uh, by itself, take on Russia. There's just not one. It doesn't mean Russia wouldn't occur losses, but, you know, Russia invests in its military. It invests a lot in its military. And it does it in such a way that it's not ridiculous. Uh, yeah, sure, there's, you know, like any, the Russian government is very, very corrupt. Everybody's always known that. Too. They've always been known for that. But one thing about it is that when it comes to the military stuff, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of bad deals that go on and people get paid off and what, ha what have you. But they do design stuff that works. You know, it, it sometimes is a bit crude, but a beaten stick's a beaten stick as long as it can get the job done, right? And so the Russians, they do, you know, make stuff that works. Um... With Syria, what's going on in Syria, they're also finding out, uh, you know, by rotating airplanes and stuff like that, what works in combat, what doesn't. So, almost like just before World War II, where the Germans got training in the Spanish War, uh, they basically, the, the Russians are getting training in Syria. Now you say, yeah, but so is NATO in the United States. Yes, that's true too, uh, but the thing is, is the Russians are actually, you know, really testing their equipment to the, to the extreme for the first time uh, on foreign soil, in that sense, in that kind of a setting, right? Whereas, yeah, they, they intervene, whenever, whenever the Russians usually intervene in another country, they usually send out the low-grade stuff. They don't send out the high-grade stuff. But in Syria, they are bringing in the high-grade stuff as well. And you can see that. And, of course, in Syria, uh, there's rumors that uh, ISIS has shot down a U.S. Uh, supply plane or something, or I don't know if, it, I don't think it was a fighter, but they, they shot down a, either a reconnaissance airplane or something like that. And of course the U.S. is denying this. And I'm going to get back to Syria in a bit. Again, there's some pretty crazy stuff in here. Uh, but uh, yeah, Russia is definitely on alert. Now this is something, I, I, I just caught a whim of it, you'll have to look into it for yourself. But apparently, because the Russians are pretty on edge right now, like they pretty much put out the statement that they can't retreat from NATO. NATO is completely surrounding them, and they reserve the right to preemptively strike the missile systems that are going around NATO. So, basically, Putin has fired up to 50 commanders that, uh, I don't know how, what the litmus test was or what, but anyway, guys that would not go uh, all the way. You know, in other words, if NATO would attack, they would stand down. So, unlike Obama, where Obama fired, like, you know, like 200 personnel or whatever, military personnel, to get yes men uh, that, you know, basically wouldn't go along with a war uh, and you just put in, you know, your, you know, Petraeus and those type of guys who are really, you know, Petraeus is kind of a flip-flop uh, in a lot of ways, but the thing is, is that uh, at the end of the day, you got these really incompetent, spineless cowards uh, for generals in the states that are, you know, basically, what are, they don't even, I don't even think they really realize what they're doing. Because if they did, they would definitely stop doing what they're doing. And you would have a military coup in the United States. You know, because just, just out of self-preservation, uh, going to war with Russia is a death sentence for the world. That said, the Russians, what they're doing is, they're looking for guys that are going to commit whenever, whenever, because they, right now, they, they're convinced that there, there's, war is an inevitable there's no way out of the war. Uh, it, it's beyond. It's almost at an irreversible point where Russia is going to have to do something soon. Uh, soon meaning in the next couple of years. Uh, 
So what that means is the generals and commanders or whatever that Putin has fired may uh, 